shows that make you laugh, shows that make you think, music that moves you. It can only be one place. Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Good afternoon, everyone. You have joined us at Distill It, a 360-degree view of life in sports. We are broadcasting from beautiful, I know it says just Hollywood, but it, it's there's downtown. No downtown. I know Hollywood. there's downtown. There is downtown, there and is we're no in it. Hollywood. We are here at the Sunset Gower <laughs> Studios at UBN. We're in the heart of Hollywood. We're downtown Hollywood. <laughs> it's going to say it up there at some You did point. grow up in L.A., right? I did. We have a downtown, and we're <laughs> in it. We're right here in it. Anyway, welcome very much to our show today. We are very excited to be here, and I am joined by the ever-lovely, the ever-wonderful, my fantastic <laughs> partner in crime and everything else. It's so true. In it everything is. else. Well, not everything. I do have a husband, but <laughs> you you know, not everything. Is your partner in crime? Some good things? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting older, though, you know, so sometimes not so much. <laughs> so I keep you around. Avery Schwitzer, thank you for being here. Did I say Thank everything? you for keeping me around. Oh, you keep me around, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm definitely, yeah. Anyway, uh, we are uh, partners in a company called The Distillery, Inc., and we work with athletes from all over the world who are transitioning out of their careers in professional sports or amateur, amateur sports sometimes. And that is why we are here talking about sports because we love it and we think that we have the right to sit here every couple of weeks so and we share do. our thoughts. We but show really, up and talk. What we do is we look at sports from all different angles, not just what's going on in the field. So we really hope that um, our shows intrigue you and that you join in the conversation. We have a fantastic guest who we were just sitting here talking to before we started, who I found out have more connection to than I even such a small world, such a small world so that wild. I even realized. And we're going to introduce him in a minute. But before we do, as usual, we like to uh, spend a couple of minutes saying hello to our engineer. New, this is Ryan. Welcome, Ryan. Welcome, Thank Ryan. We're very, <laughs> very excited to have you here. We are at the UBN studios in. Uh, on, what, what? UNB, UBN Studios yeah, at the Sunset like Gower Studios. Studios. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we always love hearing from you. So if you are watching us on Facebook, please send your comments through. We check them all the time. And if you would like to call in, our number is 323-284-7826. Every couple of weeks, we like to take a minute and talk about what's going on in the world of sports, what's interesting us today. And we think thought, and he doesn't even know that we're going to ask him, that maybe we could get our uh, our guest to join in in a moment. What's on your mind, Era? I have to just give one quick shout out to Jay Beltran and his amazing team, including his longtime trainer, Pepe Riley. Um, really tough weekend, but they were amazing. Ray fought um, Saturday night, lost his WBO lightweight title to Jose so Pedraza, upset. but it was an amazing fight. Um, unfortunately, these things happen, and this is the way it works out, but they have worked hard for ages. I've watched them. I've watched the process, watched their journey, supporting them, cheering them along all, all the way, and just my heart goes out. But you guys are amazing, and so Good I'm luck you. to you, Ray, no yeah. matter what you end up Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. The distillery team is behind you yeah. 100%. Yep. And you want to stand up and show your cat suit so you can talk oh, about I'm the wearing, next thing? I'm wearing a cat suit in honor of Serena Williams because I cannot believe that in this day and age we're still worrying about and talking about what it is that women wear to work, including an amazing, powerful, and therapeutic cat suit that the woman needs to have on to really help keep her healthy and safe throughout her matches. And, and now, of all things, the French Open has said that they're going to impose a strict dress code policy because for whatever reason the cat suit was just not up to up to standards and I'm appalled so in, in honor of, of it, but Serena, here you I'm have wearing, to stand I'm up wearing, well you're not going to see it but I'm wearing my own cat suit and I think that we should be able to wear what we want and what we need to to work. I, I really wish everybody here could see the cat suit I wish, that Ava is wearing. Well, I, I want to tell you. I wish they could see our guest laughing because I don't yeah. think he was, he was prepared to, I don't think to, he dis to discuss I'm very, Serena's very cat suit. With the cat suit. Oh my gosh. She hasn't stood up yet. She hasn't taken off her jacket. It's it's <laughs> it's intimidating, the cat suit. Really? But yes. Yeah. But no, what's I think appalling is that we're having this conversation. Well, here's the interesting thing also is the French Open is notoriously well known for allowing 
players to wear whatever they want to wear sure. and so much fashion we did a whole show on fashion and sports and right. i don't know if you remember a lot right. of the outfits that we put on you know on the on the show yeah. to talk about yeah. were serena at the french open absolutely so what the heck's changed and how fun that you can as an athlete can be able to show up and and not just and play the game are. but be who you are and exactly. show off an amazing personality and wear some amazing outfits and it's and and, and, it w and it's funny it's kind of what drives interest i think a lot of the interest in the french open right you know, because it's, you know, not a lot of people watch clay court tennis anyway. Sure, sure. And, and it was part of that whole game. So it's absolutely ridiculous. Who can we talk to? You know, there's my list of things of like people like we really have to have a big conversation with the NC2A in general. We do, and do now we apparently we have to go through the whole tennis world, the entire t <laughs> the entire tennis <laughs> world, just, just the French, just the French, and the French. On top of it, I they know, love their I clothes. Know. They're like, I this know. is their, you know, whole couture. Come on, right? It's ridiculous, wild. absolutely ridiculous. Our guest, I'm going to drag him in right now. I'm going to give him a better introduction to this. But this is our guest, Coach Bill Smith, before we get to the proper introduction. <laughs> what sport news this week got got you interested? The cat suit absolutely uh, drew me in. I, I still, as my dad would say, I couldn't figure it out if I had a figure out. You have to figure out what they're doing <laughs> first and then right. try to figure out what people are thinking. I think it's... Um, Particularly when it's something medical related, and um, I, I don't, I don't get it. And it's, it's, it just shows us this, we still have a long way to go. Yeah. Where you can make up rules as you go. I'm a big rules guy. Uh, I grew up with 15 brothers and sisters. Oh my god. And my mom had a lot of rules. And uh, can we just do a little bow down to your mother? Because yeah. that's <laughs> like, I don't even know you that well. She's and that's listening amazing. in Arizona. She's uh, hey mom, you're awesome. <laughs> I have one, and I'll let me tell you something. It ain't easy. It's a lot of work. One. Yeah, she'll be yeah. 93 this September. Congratulations! God bless her. Congratulations! And happy early birthday. Thank you. Mm. All right. So you were intrigued by the whole cat suit, and and, and you're and I see you're wearing a Rams hat, and so you know. Right. I, I grew up Go as Rams. a teenager and a young kid admiring Jack Snow and Roman Gable oh and gosh. the fearsome foursome. And I had I'm glad they came back to L.A. because my son, who's been an athlete since he was 18 months old, told me one day, Dad, he's like, I've never seen a pro football game. I said, that's right. They're not yeah. here. I immediately took him the next weekend to see the Chargers versus San Diego, hmm. uh, San Diego versus the Raiders, excuse me. And he got, and I got to see a game for the first time in 20 years yeah, or so. Yeah. So it's nice to see it. And I live in Vegas now, so I'm anticipating the it's very exciting, Raiders huh? coming there. I went to four hockey games. I've never been to a hockey Hockey's game in my fun. life. You guys had it a is great fun. season. So that, that I was at the first game after the tragic shooting. Unbelievable energy. Mm. Um, just a force. They were they were destined. To be great, and it, it's an amazing story. That is the most amazing story I've ever yeah. seen in sports history. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, now I'm going to properly introduce you. So uh, I met Coach Bill Smith because my son David, um, as you do during the summer, stick your kids in camp. And um, Coach Smith, Smith's uh, camp, Bev, Beverly, Bevwood Fun Camp, sorry, um, is one of those camps that is run through the Beverly Hills school system. And my son wanted to play basketball, and so I signed him up. And I met you because I actually came in with a complaint. And, right. and you look like the guy in charge. And <laughs> the first thing he said to me when I went up to, to not in a mean way, but to, to give you some feedback, you had an energy and a love about you, how you introduced yourself and how you talked to me about the challenge that I had with, you know, what my issue was. I was like, I, I, I literally, I came, yeah. I saw Aaron not yeah, long after, did. I'm like, we have to talk to him. We have to talk to him because I could see immediately that you've been around kids for a long time, that you have a passion for sports and the way you were conducting things. Mm -hmm. We would want to have a conversation with somebody like you. And then I come to find out that you've been a coach for some 35 odd years. I won't say how many exactly until you tell me I can <laughs> or you tell us yourself um, and that you were on the first um, LA City Championship team of Crenshaw High School. Now growing up in LA we were, yeah. I mean we know about the, the Crenshaw High School basketball dynasty mm -hmm. and you being on that first team and, and we wanted to hear a little bit about your experience. So welcome, thank you so much for coming thank to the show. Thank you. You guys are very gracious, and I'm I'm honored to be here today. Um, it's great. It was great being at Crenshaw, opening a new school. A little backstory: no one really wanted to go there because all our brothers and sisters went to Manual Arts in Dorsey, yeah. 
We don't want to be here. We don't. And we showed up, and everything was brand new. Can I tell you something really fast? I So I wanted to do some research, and I looked up Crenshaw High School and the history of Crenshaw High School, right. and it was very interesting to find out that it was in, in a very wealthy neighborhood, apparently, and that mm-hmm. it was, you know, like exactly what you're saying. Like it was kind of one it of those too, places where yeah. – it was like supposed to be a little sn- snobby and a little bit of exactly. this. Exactly, <laughs> you were going to be soft if you went there. Right, really? that was the, the word on the street. <laughs> and I was, so we didn't. We, we really, but immediately I say the first day, wow, these are actually TV sets in every room. They were like forty by forty, huge things. But back in the seventies, that was like Big the George deal. Jetson era. Yeah. And we got there. We created the Cougar logo, the colors. I was a first class from '68 to '71 to go through and be a part of uh, history. It's amazing. The 50th anniversary, by the way, is this year. That's incredible. And what a, and what a dynasty it's had since. Like, you started it. You can, and, and now the coach that was there at your camp, that mm-hmm. was Willie, right? That was Willie, the Willie West. The as, Willie as West. As Donnie Aaron says, the great one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have an affinity. I'm in love with him as a person. Um, being raised by a, by a, my dad was a bishop, and my mom she did whatever she wanted. She's the general. Well, she she had 15 <laughs> kids, so let's be honest. Exactly. Well, if she didn't do whatever she, she wanted, she might indeed. not have made it, right? That's exactly right. Well, well, Willie was the first person outside of my family to acknowledge me at, as something special. And I never forgot I was voted most inspirational player mm-hmm. on that first team. It was my first year ever playing basketball. I beat out the odds. There was guys that played for him for four years. He cut them all, and somehow he kept me – and uh, we've had a great, great, great relationship. I've been, I think, at every Hall of Fame induction. I was at his wedding, for Christ's sake. I have, people call me, do you have Willie's number? I'm like, of course I have it. You don't have it? And uh, I'm very close. He's one of the, I'd say I had about five Hall of Fame mentors. He's one. Mm-hmm. And he's the most important one. Aside my folks, my folks are number one. I say, Willie, sorry, you're number two. <laughs> well, it was it's amazing that he comes to your camp and he's a part of that. And I want to ask you that, um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk in a lot of different ways about this, but you've now been a coach for a long time. Mm-hmm. You're around children and you're inspiring children. I'm sure you took some of that skill set that you bring to the table from Willie and from your experience with him. So can you tell us, you know, maybe from your perspective, not just with Willie, but what is something that he's taught you about what it means to be a great coach and how are you using that today in your, in your, or over the past 35 years in your career? The biggest thing I got from Coach Wes is, is the word confidence. He's a very quiet guy, but if Coach Wes says, you can be pretty good, hmm. changes your life. Um, his demeanor, the fact that he cares, and that and that positive reinforcement, the acknowledgement factor, uh, and he was he was tough. I mean, we we did three man weaves with medicine balls on a football field. Fast break. We ran hills. We we had a nickname for him, Wall to Wall Willie, because <laughs> if we didn't do exactly what he wanted, which wasn't very much often, we always did, but every now and then we we go a little slow in practice. Drop the balls. Let's go wall to wall, yeah. and we'd run for like. 45 minutes till somebody would pass out. And then we go, okay, you guys ready to listen? But the first thing he said when he talked at the camp was, these guys listen to me. And I always watch him when he talks, and that's the first thing he talks about. We weren't supposed to win. He's right. We were a Cinderella story. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he instilled, he injected confidence into us. So that's the biggest thing I take away I can say. And and so now how does that look like in your when you're coaching kids, is it is it? How do you instill confidence? I'm in really t- curious. In, in particular, when you know you have kids who maybe aren't the most talented athletes, or they're on teams that maybe aren't performing as well and succeeding as much. How do you still be able to instill confidence, have them carry that day to day? Part of it is it comes from becoming a student of what you want to get good at, mm-hmm. understanding that fundamentals of life is. That's why I love sports. The fundamentals of life is so apropos to the fundamentals of, of sport. Study, Larry Bird wasn't the greatest athlete that ever lived. Um, Magic Johnson was a tall guy, but he wasn't athletic like Michael Jordan. But we talk in Michaels, we talk Michael, Magic, and Bird in the same breath. There's a reason for that. Right. They were tougher yeah. than anybody else, and they mastered their craft. So I'm very f- 
kind of scientific about that part. I'm huge on history, huge. All of my kids from the last 40 years know who the sky hook. They know about it. They know about the beginning of basketball. They know who invented it, James Naismith. They know that the basket's 10 feet high because of the first balcony and the first one. They know more facts about the game than probably most professional players. But to me, my dad, who was a bishop and used to be a, he was a, a barber, he said, Bill, before I started cutting hair, I had to study the anatomy of the head. Sure. And if you really look at people like Kobe, all these great players, they have an affinity for studying their craft and understanding what do I need to do the master and then put the time in. So that's, that's where getting with kids now it's different today because some of the things that we did back in the day or coaches did back in the day are, are tremendously taboo, screaming at kids, maybe grabbing a kid or maybe hitting them on the, on the, uh, with a SWAT, which was corporate punishment, which was okay back then. No. I have had an opportunity because I've been at the grassroots level, and I'll give El Rodale and the Beverly Hills Unified School District the credit. When I first went there, I'm like, uh, they're five. <laughs> they're six. And they were driving me crazy. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, coach, a- coach, he won't, he's, he won't let me get in front of he, he won't. He's in front of me in line. I went, oh, my goodness. And I met a guy named Rudy Benton who changed my life. He showed me this thing called training camp where you empower kids by giving him a job, positive reinforcement, validation. He said, I've been to gangbanging areas, and I have gangbangers doing valet in 10 minutes. I thought he was crazy. Yeah. But when he did this first tr- demonstration, he had 60 kids of all different sizes, and one had one arm, and, and he did this training camp. It was magical. It was all about you're going to be the best guy here today. Who wants to be that guy? Who wants to be the Michael Jordan of this room? And all of a sudden, the kids started perking up and started yeah. taking their chest out. And then the validation, he went nuts. He was doing cartwheels on the sideline. <clears throat> so I learned real quickly. I said, man, this stuff will work. It'll work when you're dealing with five-year-olds, two-year-olds, or 100-year-olds. And when you start looking at the great coaches, they all kind of had that kind of – they had something – that they could say and the kids bought in. And then from there, you talk. Another thing, too, is bigger for me is values. Because of my background and my upbringing, uh, the good Lord has put me in a position with my family being a very spiritual family to understand that values are the most important thing. So if you can intertwine the values, and that's something a guy named John Wooden mastered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I studied him quite a bit. And I started studying other coaches. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Pete Carroll actually sat down with John Wooden. Right. When he came to L.A.? Yeah. Oh, so that's how he came up with competition. Pete, what do you stand for? I know what I stand for. I stand for ethics. I stand for hard work. There's no one in the world, after watching my mother, can tell me they're going to outword me. It ain't going to happen. Right. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Yeah. She raised 15 children. And I'm like, and she's not the perfect, most perfect person in the world. But she's mama. Yeah. yeah. So you, you respect your elders. Right. I, saw I have that. an affinity for kids and older people. Most people don't know that because uh, I see older people as being like kids right. because they, they start to, as you kind of the Benjamin Button theory, but they start to go backwards. And That's what's people, wrong with me then. <laughs> <laughs> and people have to take care of them, which is cool. But I, when they start talking, I listen. Sure. Yeah. They have knowledge. Yeah. So one of the things that I really try to get across to kids and, and my coaches that I've trained is find a wise man. Right. Then find another and then another and, and a woman. A wise woman. Sure. Find the people that know. You don't have to be exactly like them, but take the good from it. Take what they have. And that's what great business people do. They don't reinvent the wheel. They go and look at something that's working. Right. And they use it as a template, and then they add their flavor to, to it. it. Yeah. And I've been able to do that in a lot of different areas because I have got great mentors. So let me ask this question because it actually was recent in the news this week. Um about the unfortunate death of a football player um, at the University of Maryland. Oh, tragic. Um, tragic. Tragic from, from, from heat stroke, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, in fact, I sent it to you because I think that we should do a whole show on it. But, but one of the things that's come up is the coaching, that the coaches were pushing too hard, that the coaches were not really paying attention to the needs of the, the student. And... I, you know, I, I hear you saying, and I know it's true, coaching is very different than it was 40, 50 years ago where, you know, you could yell, you could scream, you could physically hurt 
mm-hmm. you know, uh, an, a, an athlete under your, you know, your your um, umbrella in on your team. Why do you see how? Do you see it happening today, even still, where coaches are really not taking oh, yeah. care of their players, and why? Well, there's two things you hit right on the nose. Number one, they're living in the Stone Age. Uh, people used to tell me, Coach, you're reinforcing those kids, but you're giving them little things and this and that, and you're making them. I said, look, this is not 1952. It's 2015, 16. Those coaches, I think, have good intent, but all they know – Think about how you were raised. You only know what you know, mm-hmm, sure. and they only know one way, and they haven't. But there's no excuse today that you can't go outside of your box. You can get on the Internet, for Christ's sake, sure. and be able to figure out the new techniques in the way. The new era, because the athletes are different, you have to evolve with the time. There's a guy named Bob Knight who tragically found that out, but Indiana University created Bob Knight, right? and they allowed him to operate in this mushroom, and then all of a sudden at the end yeah. – they almost set him up for failure. And so you have to evolve with the times. So for me, I've been very, very fortunate enough to be able to see that and evolve with the times. I, I, I'll give you an example, Luke Walton. When Luke Walton showed up in L.A., first thing I, I heard him say, I said, he's going to be a good coach. Said, How would you know that? He said, my guy's going to look forward to coming to work every day. Yeah. And I knew Byron Scott personally. B. Scott would stand there with his arm folded. And, yeah. I'm the coach. Hmm. You're the underling. Stay away from me. Yeah. He actually said on one show, I talked down the swaggy P. He talked down to the players. What and he was you? a player. Did that motivate a, but, him? But he, back in the day when he was coming up, that cachet was cool. Right. It's how tough you are. No, we're not going to drink water. That's 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 saw. Hmm. Hello. And the other reason why I think it happens a lot, and I, and, and I, I had a guy who worked for me named Aki Trent. One of the best coach I've ever had work for me. He's a licensed, certified strength and conditioning coach. My son Broderick, he's actually his personal coach. This guy was so good, and he, me and him have great conversations about this. Every coach that coaches should have license and and, and certification nice. in athletic training. Yeah. They don't. I, I've had my son's one of my son's coaches in high school tell me, "I'm trying to kill him, Bill." I said, why are you trying to kill my kid? Yeah. He's a nice kid. Why are you trying to? <laughs> but it, it, not literally, but he was trying to run him. And my son, all the other kids were, were slowing down, and he was running over all of them. Sure. He came to me and says, how did he get like this? I kind of smiled and said, you obviously don't know me. And the kid's been playing since he was 18 months old. It's been, he's been My son had been to like 14 Final Fours, and he was 15 years old. Yeah. So he's seen the greatest athletes and seen the effort level. And I've always tried to coach him from a perspective of my coaching style now is I don't have to raise my voice. They have to have something on the table. The way you get people to work today is you empower them, and you also are empowered to coach them. You ask for their permission (coughs) through (laughs) we have certain rules and stuff. I have 14 commandments that I have. For coaching, and I took <laughs> we that. should have done a we should have done a meme. Coaches, fourteen that. commandments. Right. Oh, and, you have and, to send and, them to us. And, and number seven is like, "Thou shalt never come before me, mad about playing time after a game immediately <laughs> and screaming." And yelling. <laughs> I have a daughter who's coaching, and she called me last year. And she said, "Daddy, um, she was coaching at Cover City High School." And she said, "This little girl, we lost our first game, and she was screaming at me." About what? Well, who? How long you been coaching? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and the dad, she said, I was more set because the dad sit there and let her do it. Right. I said, Bray, part of that is forecasting, which means you have to predict some of this stuff. I said, What do you have? What do you stand <laughs> forecasting. for? Forecasting. So I said, You ever heard of John Wooden? She said, Yeah. I said, Well, his prayer minister says, which was brilliant. The top of it said competitive greatness, and the bottom being the fundamentals of industrialness and all that stuff. He formed that, and he and he got some of the greatest athletes in history, and he had this amazing run. He talked to Pete Carroll, as I said earlier. He talked to John Calipari, who won a few championships after he talked to Coach Wooden. And then he, Wooden was a process contact guy. Process is the stuff we're talking about. How do you get them to buy in? How do you right. get them to go hard? Hmm. I've worked with coaches who are screaming, yelling, cussing the kids. And I'm like, what is this all about? What part of that is motivational? What part of that? <laughs> I don't want my kid yeah. listening to somebody doing that. If you have them buy in by saying, if we have these commandments, my 14 commandments, we get in a circle and we go through and I say, guys, 
this is our best opportunity, I feel, for us to be great. Sometimes the commandments go to 15 because somebody will say, yeah, Coach, I believe and I think this should be. And well, I give them some say-so in that. And then I said, okay, we're going to sign a contract. And this goes for parents also, sure. which is the biggest, biggest educating part. They go home. They take it to their parents. My daughter did this at cover, after that incident at Culver. She, she put together her 14 pillars of success. Excuse me, 12. I drafted six with her. I said, you go home tonight, and you come up with your – so the, she, she sent me an email. I said, get number eight out of there. You will respect the coaches. We are like, you ain't in charge of nothing. <laughs> this is their team. They're playing. You're the facilitator of their learning. Wow. And so she was like, okay. She, I said, well, send it to the head coach. Send it to the head coach. She was like, this is great stuff. Where would you get this? Sure. Well, yeah. my 40 years of experience – and studying the game and all the great coaches and my background, and you can teach values and virtues when you do that. We talk all the time about sports really as a metaphor for life, but I think that goes back to you know, to be successful, period, in life, in mm -hmm. business, working with a group of people, period. You have to have that shared value system. And I think it's, it's amazing that that standard is set right off the bat. And the student athletes have to adhere to that. Really, it's such it, well, such a beautiful lesson in terms of how life operates and how you really can set yourself up for success. You, well, and you take and you and people. you allow you allow the the kids, the players, to take responsibility. Sure. their their piece of it. You yeah. know, I think that when, you know, in, in a little bit of a way, when you don't set that up, you almost set up the coach and the team to be a little bit adversarial in a right. way. They're not part of the the right. whole process. They're not part of the process. And I think today, in in the world today, we're all starting to appreciate and understand the value of process and being a part of that sure. process and how much buy-in you get and how much inspiration that you can bring to people when they feel like they're part of the process. Yeah. But one of the, I, I, to add to what you're saying, I think one of the things <coughs> that you just said that inspired me is that you said you're a facilitator for learning. And I, I feel like when I watch great coaches on every level, and Ava and I are students of many sports, we are true diehard sports fans i will say era her favorite is soccer football we both love football different <laughs> sides of the world <laughs> you know mine's american football but mine's we're proper football pro yes yours is proper <laughs> football and i will acknowledge that okay Thank you. i do acknowledge i bow down i got it um <laughs> but right. i love it too but we're but we're fans of a whole bunch of sure. sports and i think when i have seen or watched or read about great coaches that idea of I'm the facilitator for learning really comes through. Now, they may not say it that way, but I really wanted to, to highlight that and, and ask you, um, given that everybody has different learning styles, whether it's mm -hmm. on the field or off the field, how mm -hmm. as a coach do you recognize and, and in a structure where you have to have a certain structure because you, you've got to get them all playing to the same in the same direction, how do you take those individual learning styles or personalities and get a team to meld? Yeah. It, it is truly a process. It's one of the most beautiful things when you get it. I can tell you sitting here today, and I coached 40 years, every team in the moment they got it, that, that's even more, uh, it's really cool. But it's, it's getting them to buy into the concept by – allowing them, as I said, to put something on the table. If they have something on the table, uh, then I don't have to yell and scream. And if we, if we understand it as a group, and then they put their stuff in the middle of the table, and then we go forward from there. Uh, I, I watch, I've studied people like Phil Jackson. <laughs> coach West, my high school coach, he, he, didn't, he screamed in practice. He sat there like this calm, but his job was done in practice. So how you do it is, you empower everybody by figuring out, and I learned this from another great coach, Al Skates, who coached in the Beverly Hills, who won 19 national titles. Al, how did you get all those great volley? Karch, Karai, and all those guys. Bill, I treated everybody different. Blew me away. I went, what do you mean? There's team rules. Everybody's the same. I treated nobody the same. Right. And I was like, <laughs> I want to yeah. take a picture of your face right yeah, now and like put it up behind my desk yeah. and say, don't treat people the same. <laughs> exactly, that's it. Because they're going to scare them. That was great. It was million, I was it? shocked when he yeah. said it because I was like, but then I got it because there's, there's yeah. a message there. Of course you have team rules. There's a great incident with Pat Riley and the Lakers, and they lost by 40-some points to Boston. And Pat was like, I'm not want anybody coming late. Nobody come, no girlfriends, nothing. 
And here Kareem shows up the next day with his father. And Pat's little ultimatum went out the window, but he's a great coach, so he flipped it. See, here's a, probably the most, most uh, uh, downtime for an athlete ever, and Kareem's got his dad with him. Right. So he, had, he came up with this moniker about we're going to take a stand, think about somebody who inspired you, you know, looking at Mr. Alcindor. And it really comes down to understanding that and then breaking your team up into jobs. That's something I did learn from Pat Riley. You have a job. You're a shooter. Most coaches scream at kids when they don't shoot. You can't scream at a shooter. Sorry. Yeah. Shooters are like offensive basketball, too. Mm -hmm. There's two hats. I'm reading Wall Street Journal. Stocks and bonds. Yeah. That's offense. Defense. Yeah, Dennis Rodman. Run a world piece. Cuckoo. Yeah. La, la, la. <laughs> but under control. You have to be a crazy to play defense. I was a great defensive player. I love the fact that, <laughs> oh, man, you're not going to score. You might not score the rest of your life when I finish with you tonight. Right. I would talk to people, but I figured out there was two sides. For people, what happens in sports but at every level, there's a crossover where the person's going too fast on offense because they got all that defensive energy. So you teach that, and we get a role. A role is a job. Mm -hmm. Your job is to get 15 rebounds a game. If I can get you to get that 15 rebounds – you get five threes a game, yeah. and my man here gets mm. nine assists, we're going to fit real well. Sure. I coached uh, – the greatest player I've coached was Reggie Miller. And I was a junior college coach, and my wife said at the time, they listened to you. I said, yeah, they didn't know me, but I'd been in the league three years. I went to the finals two years, three years in a row. I lost by one point the first two years. Then I got the number one pick, Reggie Miller. Yeah. So I said, if anybody can get ten assists, ten rebounds, eight steals, I don't care who you are, I had all stars from everywhere – all the colleges, junior colleges. And the first game, Reggie had a triple-double trying to show me that he wanted to be a team player. And my wife said, wow. But that's what winners do. Right. You, it's getting the right message to them. You mm -hmm. want to? I told him, you want to get 50 points a game? I'm the wrong coach. You want to just work on shooting? Go play for Coach Dokes. I've been in the finals two years in a row. When they heard that, they were like. Right. And it piqued their interest. Yeah. I said, this is how we do it. And they bought in, and, and of course, we won the championship that year. It was unbelievable. So I think that's a very interesting, uh, maybe style that Aira and I have come across in the with the clients that we talk about, uh, mm -hmm. that we've talked to, and and one of the things that we find, I don't know, maybe it's impulse control. I don't know how you say it, but what you just said, where you kind of pushed back and said, "Look, I don't want you if you want this." Right. Right. And 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 how much benefit there is to both a team and a player when there's that kind of resistance to going, you know, for 50 points or there's, you know what I'm saying? It's like, how, how do you teach? Is that something that comes naturally to kids who are athletes or do you feel like it's something that has to be taught that kind of, that kind of resistance that I can hang back, I can pick my spot, I can. You, are you asking what kids are non-aggressive toward Sports, sports, and doing their job, or just an even no, even even an athlete who's older, not just a kid, you know, who is, um, who sees benefit from not always rushing in or jumping in or like trying to outdo the other their other teammates. Like he's got twenty points, I better get twenty one. Like being competitive. Sorry mm -hmm. if I'm not saying it the right way, but being competitive, but and having that drive to be competitive, but understanding that it's you to can be strategic. To be strategic, thank you. See, she completes me. I do. <laughs> well, I think it's it, the biggest job for a coach for me is figuring out what your strengths are. I'm not going to have you shooting three pointers <laughs> if you're Shaquille O'Neal. There's <laughs> certain things you're going to do that you're good at, and my job is to highlight your greatness and then eliminate your weaknesses. So I've had kids I've taught from three and four to high school and six guys in the NBA. So it's like I had a kid once in the summer. We went 9-0. and oh, He was 9. He learned to pivot and pass and not travel, and that was a slam dunk for him. Right. When he got the ball first, he we called him happy feet. He was running all over the place. He slid, and he thought he was doing the electric slide, and he was just <laughs> rushing. Yeah. By the time we got to the championship game, I was like, and so I could acknowledge him 
So you did a great job. Make sure you move the ball and you did what you had to do. You didn't turn the ball over. And that's a small thing, but that's huge to a person. The one thing I think we do in sports in these leagues, we put kids in with <clears throat> kids who are really, really good, and we got a kid who's just beginning to learn to play. And there's no there's no really framework for it, and the kid feels terrible. How'd you like to be the kid on the court? You're like, I hope they don't pass to me. Yeah. Right. You know? So I have this whole different kind of philosophy when it comes to that. There's a competitive league called the BHBL in Beverly Hills, and they asked me actually to run the league when it first started because they knew I was a pretty good coach, and I had a lot of kids in my camp program too, but I, I, I declined because they asked me to stop doing my camp during the time they were doing the program. I said, hello, no. Please don't. And I was like, I'll in-service your coaches. And they were like, no, nah, that's okay. So I said, well, maybe you're not really interested in developing the kids because I'm interested in developing the kids. If I had the league, I'm going to have a developmental league where – those eight, nine, and ten year olds who are like ability. I do the same thing in my camp every week. Mm -hmm. Takes me a little longer, but we figure out what their niche is, what's their comfort level. We had a kid; he was ten. He didn't want to be there. He had never done sports. In fact, he took off. Yeah, you were telling that story and, on the and, last and, day and, of uh, camp. My coach followed them, and in the end, the lady wrote us a three-page yeah. letter saying yeah. how great we were. Yeah. But we we didn't want him to get hurt. He came back. He came back on Tuesday. And I was like, well, he's back, and I made an announcement. He's back. Mr. Goldberg's back. And we rolled out the red carpet. But we recognized physically he was smaller. So we put him with the nine-year-olds yeah. where he wasn't over-intimidated. He got, he got the MVP of his group. Mm, yeah. And I didn't tell the coaches to vote for him. It just happened because we put him in a position to be successful. Yeah. That, that's the skill I have. I, I've learned over the years I could recognize kids at four and go, my goodness. Right, there's something Look there. at the motor on that kid. Hmm. Look at his footwork. Look at the, the ability to skip. I, I had to break component skills from being a, a really good athlete and and when I first came to the ER to break it down so I got to be able to get into a four-year-old. My passion is basketball. So, of course, when I started my program in 1994, I started writing curriculum. I'd already written curriculum for four schools I've set up, Rosewood uh, Elementary, Carpenter Elementary in the Valley, UES, UCLA. I've set up whole programs based on my tenant and my style could people watch what I do and wanted me to emulate it. So it really comes down to making sure the kids in if I had a five year old league, if you go watch some of the leagues, five year olds, it's like watching grass grow because they sit there and and the, and the referee <laughs> is like, okay, you stand over here. The referee coaches and I don't know what they do in practice. But I had a I had a league with little kids. They scored two hundred points in a game. Can I tell you? I <laughs> I want you to know our kids play on a lot of sports teams together. Yeah. Right. They played baseball. I can tell you what they do during the practice. <laughs> yeah. Great intention. Love yeah. the dads. But, but they, you know, but they get on the they get on the field yeah. and it was the same they thing. Like don't the, the umpire was like that yeah. you're not they're not learning. Okay? If yeah. you're not learning. Yeah. I've mastered the ability to be able to say, how can I take this and get it to there? Yeah, right. And sequentially. So it's all like step by step. I have a 10-step a curriculum. If people put their kids to what my kid went through and he's, and that he's willing to do it, I'm not going to force him. My kid, by the way, stepped in at 18 months old. And one of the pros that used to play with me, Anthony Frederick Buddha, said, Coach, look at your nickname is Chocolate. Look at Chocolate. He was in there with the five-year-olds. I never invited him to people. So you don't worry about him being burned out? That kid had that in him. He from got that probably from me. But he had this passion for the game. It was unbelievable. So it really comes down to putting your kid in, in a position uh, where he's successful. Getting back to my league. Wait, wait. Before you do, I just want to say you've had a couple of people who – Robbie Curtis, who's giving you a nod and saying you're, you're <laughs> awesome. And one of our other uh, regular um, – uh, watchers Betsy Davis was thanking you for all the great information that you're giving. She has two boys as well that love sports. Thank you. Um, but I also just want to say if anybody has a question for Coach Smith, to please feel free to give us a call at 323-284-7826, or you can comment, and I will pass them, as you can see, along to, to Coach Smith as we're talking. Please feel free. I, I want to explain the league structure. because People say, how do you get five-year-olds to score 200 points? Well, you put a point value on the skills. Once you pass the ball as a point, if you do ball reversal, which is you can teach that really easy, and that's a pro level skill, ball's on the right side, to reverse the ball, it's got to go over here. So if the ball goes two passes to there, yeah. you get three points. Hmm. When the ball moves, I'll give you Mark Murphy. One of my best friends is the assistant coach of Gonzaga, Donnie Daniels. 
We grew up together. Nice. Donnie goes. They don't ever have a good program at Gonzaga. They're so good. They're, they're <laughs> so know. fun to watch. I'm joking. Mark Few goes, yeah. when you move the ball twice, we stat practice in games. When we reverse the ball once, we shoot 48%. That, mm. That'll be one of the best in the nation. When we do it twice, we go up to 78%. Wow. When we reverse the ball three times, we get layups. Yeah. I heard him at a clinic say that. I was like, I want to play for that dude. Yeah. But they move the ball like the Warriors. And he's been doing that for the last 50. I feel he's one of the top three coaches in the game right now. And so we use point value, ball reversal, a steals two points. And I try to equalize the defense and the offensive portion. So sure. there's no well, – right now most people emphasize all offense. Yeah. And the defensive stuff is left behind. Uh, so that's kind of where it is. And they had 100 points, so pretty soon <laughs> – and by the way, they made a lot more baskets because they were doing this, because mm-hmm. they were moving the ball and stuff. And then like, your parents go, pass it, Johnny. How many times <laughs> do you hear that? You know, and the, the statistician's going, oh you know, my God. they had a 200 the point game. Yeah, right. But they learned the fundamentals and they yeah. were getting validated for the fundamental skills that they did. Because, yeah. like I said, that kid that learned to pivot might right. be able to get a point for that. I do that all the time in practices. From high school, college, and my club teams. That's great. We got, okay, we're, we're working on boxing out. We're going to do this. If you box out, it's 10 points for your team. If you give up, if you get offensive rebound. I'm a great rebounding coach. That was my strength. I've had teams get 67 rebounds in a game. Yeah. High school teams. So, so it sounds like what you're doing is kind of taking that natural competitiveness of any athlete and almost like using it to your advantage even more Absolutely. so. Sure. You know, like – Repurposing the uh, the the competitive nature of an athlete, yeah, fine like, tuning it, yeah, it's amazing, that's spectacular. Yeah. Um, I I we didn't get into a lot of your your history and your transition after you left high school um, into college. Like, did you ever play pro pro basketball? Did you ever want to? And if <coughs> if you didn't, because one of the, like I said, one of the things that Ara and I do is our as our career is work with athletes that aren't going to uh, wait, they they either gone pro and they're now retired or have left because of an injury or another or they just didn't make it for yeah. whatever reason or yeah. um, a college athlete that doesn't end up going to the pros and there's a lot of challenges that come with that did you have that challenge and if so how did you overcome it and what was your I, process I had an interesting process um Getting out of high school, I, I didn't go to school right away. I worked for two years. I actually got married in 19. And I was a pretty responsible guy. I did that for a couple of years. I said, eh, I don't think I want to do what I'm doing for the next 30 years. So I went back to school. I went to junior college at LA City College. I actually have a degree in administration of justice. And my college coach said, you want to be a coach, teacher? Nah. Exactly what I said. Yeah. Two years later, I get my administration of justice degree. And I have this great mentor, Much Minson, greatest teacher ever, Milt Davis, teacher who was last found later, had played on two Super Bowl teams, led the NFL, unbelievable legend. I had him. He made so much learning fun. So when I later became a teacher, I had to go back to him as a model going, I'm never going to be that guy standing over people. But I left LACC and I went to um, Cal State Northridge. My first year there, I was studying sociology, and my girlfriend at the time saw me, and she actually drew the picture. I have it, the moment it happened. She's drawing a picture of me refereeing a basketball game. And she said, you're not going nowhere near probation work or police work. Yeah. You have a gift. And I went, yeah, I just had a bunch of fun. It, somebody recognized it outside of me. She walked me into the credential program at Northridge. I switched majors huh. to kinesiology, and that was it. But during the time I was going to college and I finished up, I, people ask me about pro. <laughs> I had a chance to go pro and go over Holland where Coach Dyke had played after Norfridge. But being the responsible person that I was, because I had two children and I was like 22, 23 years old, I went into the teaching profession. And as I did that, I got to job at Santa Monica City College. I got to work out with some junior college athletes. At my high school, Crenshaw, one of the reasons why we were so dominant the assistant coach, Joe Weekly, big Joe mm-hmm. Weekly, he big ran Joe. a league called the Run, Shoot, and Dunk League. If you Google the Run, Shoot, and Dunk League, it was a precursor to the Drew League, which is the only pro league now in town. Mm-hmm. I played against Magic Johnson, Will Chamberlain, yeah. uh, Bill Lambeer, 
I, Dominic Wilkins, Michael Cooper had his own team, my bad company. Byron Scott didn't like to be touched. Well, apparently not because so he was I like touched, this all the but, time. But I touched him more. It was, it was great. You got to play against all your heroes. Sure. And they had an all-star team. And by the way, I made the all-star team twice. I had the best time of my life post-college because I had a Hall of Fame mentor at Santa Monica College named John McMullen and Coach Schreiber, who coached at Beverly. Yeah. And these so guys, funny. these guys were like freaking geniuses. And John's now in the Hall of Fame for junior college. And he he taught me some conceptual. We taught our players conceptualization of basketball. Well, if you research that word, if you look up a guy named Pete Maravich, he was the first guy that taught another conceptualization where he see plays four or five steps before it happened. They talk about LeBron all the time. That's what he does. He actually has he's seen so much basketball that it's only like, like three or four things that can happen on each play, and he anticipates by the strength of the player he's playing. Oh, he's going to do this. And he already knows ahead of time. I became really good. I got from being, I became that Larry Bird. I call myself the Black Larry Bird because <laughs> I learned, I used to shoot outside all the time. Just 35 footers before Steph Curry. They called me cast off. I was letting them fly. I played with a guy <laughs> named Gary Collins, and Gary averaged 30 points a game. He didn't shoot outside of six feet. He's a master. The head fake, hung up and under, <laughs> finger roll. I said, that guy, he's killing it. He's getting 70% from the floor. So I changed my game, started playing inside. And then I got with a team called Record One. We won three Pro-Am championships at Venice Beach. In fact, in 2013, I was putting their Hall of Fame with Kobe Bryant. Nice. Okay? And they, they, they called me, I had two nicknames, Steel Bill and Dollar Bill. And it was, it was great. I had the most fun of my life. We traveled, and John Frankenheimer is with a big firm called Loeb & Loeb. I, I, we're having a reunion this year. I said, John, how did you pick guys that play? We had a guy named Dave. We called him Dave Ainge. He's, he's a big-time producer. I just saw him in Thousand Oaks. We called him Dave Ainge. He looked just like Donnie Ainge, and he played like that. I was like the Dennis. I was a cross between Dennis Rodman and Akeem Olajuwon. <laughs> I was a without nightmare. Without all the tattoos uh, and, all, all, the tats. and all the little craziness. But I, I would score 30, 40 points sane. inside. <laughs> and if guys ever double-teamed me, I had these shooters. Yeah. Mike Bird, Mike Conigan out of Connecticut. Oh, we had <laughs> we they couldn't stop and we didn't, you know what? We didn't practice. We were all basketball savants. Yeah. He put together a group and we played like fifteen years ago. So I was blessed to be a part of that. So it sounds like you know, you never really stopped playing just because it wasn't pro, that you really yes. found a way to continue on. And that's one of the things, you know, you and I talk about a lot with some of our clients is that you don't have to lose that because right. you're not in it in a, in a more meaningful way. Well, that and you never stop having fun. Yeah. Before we started right. the show, we were talking also about making sure that first and foremost, the kids are having fun. And That's it seems to be... Bedwood Fun Camp. Yeah. Fun, uh, fun police. Fun camp. Yeah. It's fun not, police are there. It's not sports camp. It's not basketball camp. It is Bedwood Fun Camp. And actually, you just answered the question I had in my mind, like, why is it Bedwood Fun Camp? Yeah. I don't understand that. Well, but that now a, I know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, that, that's amazing. We have about two minutes left. I want to um, ask you, Coach, if you had to – you said confidence is kind of you know, like what you learned from your coaches and, and what really you take away. What is something that you can give in terms of a, a tip, one, to parents who have kids that are – you know, engaged in this in in sports, either at a very deep level or even just in the summer and it's camp and and yeah. they're, that's not what they intend to do. What's one tip you can give to parents of athletes, and what's one tip that you would give to a kid that you know you might be talking to who's aspiring to play in sports? To the parents, do research. Your kids are your greatest asset. You wouldn't drop them off at. Uh, Somewhere where they're throwing knives on the side of the wall, <laughs> yeah. or some or, parents or, might or, want archery, to. Or archery range. <laughs> um, find out about the people you're. I'm very picky about who I put my children with. Very picky about their philosophy. I'm very picky about people I bring into my circle. You can fake me out, but if I see you yelling and screaming at them, it's for no reason. And sometimes yelling and screaming is the way to go, but in the, the right way. Mm -hmm. You sure. have to give them enough love to have enough cachet to, to yell. Hmm. Because then they respond, oh, my gosh, he's upset. So finding the right mentors and, and do your research. For athletes, be a student 
and be a good listener. All the greatest athletes that I know of, from Michael Jordan to Kobe Bryant to LeBron James, and all the greatest business people that I know, from Bill Gates to all these other people that I've studied, they have the ability to learn from others, mm. listen, and then find, as I said earlier, find a wise man, a wise woman, and continue to, I'm doing that myself. I'm surrounding my, by, with people that know more than me, and we kind of feed off each other. Because success is not the scoreboard. No. Well, Never is. Just ask Michael Jordan. Tips for athletes and tips for all of us. For life. Yep. Honestly, I think that uh, this is what uh, I'm sure who all the people who listen to us hear all the time. Sports is a metaphor for life, and that's why we love it. Mm -hmm. And what you just gave us was more of a tip for life and not necessarily a tip for sports. Aira and I want to thank you so much for being here. It was such an honor and a pleasure to talk with you this afternoon. And we hope that thank you'll you someday so you'll come back. I know you're in Las Vegas, so maybe uh, before your next year's summer camps, we'll touch base again. You can come in and tell us what's going on in your world. I'm open 24 hours, a.m., p.m. <laughs> I never close. Where can nice. folks find you if you want to? Uh, they they can you. find me, um, my uh, email, they can email me at Bevwood, which is B-E-V-W-O-O-D, funcamp11 at gmail.com. Um, I'm actually working on a website. So right. the next month they could be able to look at BevwoodFunCamp.com. Cool. I'll tell you what. And be able you, to get it. When it's up and running, you let us know and we'll remind people on our sites exactly. as well. Absolutely. And also with the city of Beverly Hills, uh, any of their programs, uh, we've been with them with the longest outstanding vendor they've ever seen. <laughs> we've been with them 25 years. i got to tell years. you something. You're going to laugh, but when <laughs> the last day, sorry, this is very fast. When the last day of camp, we were there and you did a great presentation and Bill gave the the custodial staff flowers and I swear to you that woman's been there since I was in high school. <laughs> I kid you I yeah. kid you not. I remember I, yeah. I remember that's her. So yeah. I was like, man, that's amazing. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining us. We yeah. want to thank everyone for joining us. As always, it is uh, our honor to be able to sit here and, and share with you the amazing people that we run across in our in our world and our love of sports. We will be back next week. Normally, it's every two weeks, but uh, September is going to be a weird travel time. So yeah. um, we will be back next week with another incredible guest. So please stay tuned. Watch for our um, announcement on our Facebook page. You can also find us at thedistilleryinc.com. You can download these shows on um, iTunes, Spotify, CastBox, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. Please subscribe, like us. We love you, and we'll see you again next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Ryan.